Uh, but it's great to be back, especially in such wonderful weather. And uh, as Mike said, um, I'm officially a transpersonal psychologist, but I'm only a transpersonal psychologist three days a week. Uh, in my other days, I write poetry, um, I meditate, I bring up my children, and uh, do all the things which normal human beings are supposed to do. But um, I write poetry as well. I think poetry is um, it's a nice way of trying to describe things which can be difficult to capture in ordinary language. And I think that's why there's a really strong tradition of spiritual poetry in practically every culture in the world. Uh, we have Rumi, uh, Zafir was talking about Rumi earlier, the famous Sufi poets, lots of famous Sufi poets. But also in English poetry or um, British poetry, you've got people like William Wordsworth, uh, who wrote lots of great spiritual poetry. Uh, William Blake, um, even D.H. Lawrence, and also American poets like Walt Whitman. But every culture in the world has a tradition of spiritual poetry. So I think I write my poetry to try to describe some things which are normally outside the range of normal language. And I think spiritual experiences, uh, they transcend a lot of the, the structures of language. And language, language depends on a, a subject-object duality, a sense of me and you, uh, me and it. But in spiritual experiences, that duality is transcended. And also, uh, language depends on tenses like the past, present and future. But in spiritual experiences, uh, tenses are transcended, time is transcended. So that's why it's so difficult to, sometimes so difficult to describe these experiences in ordinary language. So I'm going to, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about my research, the research I've been, I've been doing as a transpersonal psychologist over the last 10 years or so. And I've mainly been um, doing research on people who've had powerful transformational experiences, usually following uh, negative psychological states such as bereavement or well, trauma caused by bereavement or maybe serious illness, depression, divorce, addiction and so on. In a sense the type of trauma isn't so important but when people are undergoing intense trauma something almost alchemical happens, can happen inside them. They can undergo a sudden shift in identity and a sudden shift in consciousness. For example, it's not uncommon amongst people who've been diagnosed with cancer to suddenly look at the world in a different way, to suddenly reevaluate their lives and feel that in some way they've become more awake, that life becomes more real and makes more sense and there's a wider sense of perspective and there's a sense of intense appreciation for things that we normally take for granted. And a little later on, I'm going to look at a couple of different qualities which emerge in spiritual awakening. And one of them actually is appreciation or gratitude. And we're going to try to cultivate uh, that quality. Uh, maybe another quality we'll look at is disidentification from the, the thinking mind. But I'll, exp I'll explain a little, more, a little more about that uh, later on. But first, um, let me... Uh, begin by reading one of my poems. And the question that a lot of people uh, consider uh, when we address these subjects is, what does it mean to be spiritually awakened? I mean, the word spiritual has so many different meanings to different people that it's sometimes difficult to reach a definition which makes sense to everybody. A lot of people think that spirituality is synonymous with religion. You know, you hear a lot of religious people talking about how the spiritual life is neglected in many people and how we need to regain a sense of the spiritual. But really they're just talking about their own particular religion and they're talking about following particular religious beliefs. But I think true spirituality lies outside religion. Although it can often coincide with religion. I've met quite a few religious people who I would describe as spiritual. But at the same time I've met a lot of religious people who I would describe as not spiritual. Uh, for example, fundamentalist religious people. Uh, there's very little spiritual about that, about clinging to a particular belief system in a very rigid and dogmatic way. But one thing I think it means, um, to be spiritually awakened, I think it, one thing it means is to have a more expansive sense of identity. I think in the, the normal human state, the kind of unconscious state, or the sleep state, you could call it, 
There's a sense that we are nothing more than the ego or the body. But in spiritual awakening, there's a, a more expansive sense of identity. Our identity stretches outside ourselves, outside the mind, outside the body. And it incorporates or encompasses other people, nature, other living beings. Uh, for example, let's not forget the sheep way over on the field over there. They can probably hear me, actually, with this microphone. So let's not forget the sheep. Um, let's not be speciesist about spiritual awakening. If we can experience it, surely sheep can experience it too? I'm not sure about that. That's a question for debate. But in any case, uh, when you do attain some degree of spiritual awakening, your sense of identity stretches out in compassion and empathy for other living beings, for other human beings, and also for the whole universe, the whole cosmos. There's a sense that in some way you are connected to the whole cosmos. But also there's something that happens internally as well. There's a sense that in some way you attain a deeper sense of connection to your own being. There's a sense that somehow your identity expands inwardly and you find a more, more authentic, more expansive inner self. And the reason why I've called this talk Return to Harmony is because I think that our essential nature and the essential nature which we uncover in spiritual awakening is one of harmony. And it's a harmony which is always there but it's sometimes covered over by the turbulence of our thoughts or our desires, our ambitions and our emotions. There's a lot of turbulence on the surface of our minds. And sometimes it requires us to quieten the turbulence, to calm our minds, to still our minds in order to experience that harmony beneath the surface. And there's a, good, there's a good metaphor, Rich. Before I read a poem, I'll just explain a metaphor for you. And actually, this is a kind of a meditative metaphor. It's quite difficult to say, actually, meditative metaphor. Try saying that after a couple of drinks. Um, but, um, yeah, let's try this meditative metaphor. So just close your eyes for a second. And the surface of our minds, I often associate it with the surface of the sea. Often the surface of the sea is full of the turbulence of waves, the swelling of the sea, the foaming of the waves. And thoughts pass by just like waves. They arise, they take their form, and they slowly ebb away. And sometimes they create turbulence on the surface of our minds. So just make an association between your thoughts, the waves of thoughts that pass by, and the surface of the ocean. And just watch any thoughts that arise right now. Just allow them to form and pass by. And just be aware of them. Acknowledge them. And just be aware that beneath those thoughts, beneath those waves of thoughts, there is the deep stillness of the ocean. Just like on the sea, beneath the surface of the sea, a few meters below, you suddenly fall into the stillness of the deep ocean. But just a bit like a diver now, allow yourselves to fall into the stillness of your deeper being beneath the waves of thinking. And as you fall below, feel the stillness of your being immerse you, just like the water. Feel yourself falling below into your deeper being. And 
and feel how a sense of stillness begins to fill your whole body. So you're just like a diver immersed in the stillness of your deeper being. And if you look up, you can see the waves still passing by on the surface of your mind. But you just watch them pass by. They don't disturb your deep sense of stillness. But as you watch the waves, you notice how they begin to slow down. How the surface of the sea the surface of your mind begins to calm and become still. Until it's just like the surface of a lake rather than the surface of the sea. And now, allow yourself to rise to the surface again. Bring your attention back up to your mind, up to your head, up to the surface of your being. And just notice how the surface of your mind is now so calm and still. So that even though your attention has returned to the surface of your mind. You can still feel the depths of stillness way down inside you. There's no division between the surface and the depths of your being. So retaining that sense of stillness, that sense of connection to your deeper being, let's slowly return our attention to the chair you're sitting on, to the sounds around you. And let's slowly open our eyes again. So I think it's really helpful to remember that, um, you know, often from time to time, our lives will always involve some challenges. We're always going to get stressed. Um, we're always going to experience some degree of suffering from time to time. Our minds are, are going to become turbulent. Emotions are going to arise inside us. But I think it's always helpful to remember that beneath that surface turbulence, there's always this harmony there inside us always just below the surface of our minds, just a few millimetres below the surface, you can fall into this stillness. All you need to do is allow yourself to dive into it. Sometimes all it takes is just a little space 
between two thoughts. And you can allow yourself to fall into that space. I think that's why we love um, activities which involve some degree of mind quietening, like yoga. I was just doing yoga outside on the... I was trying to do yoga outside on the, on the hill. I kept falling over because of the, the steep gra gradient. But, um, you know, I think one of the reasons why we love yoga so much is it because it creates a little space inside us. It quietens the mind, it quietens the turbulence, and allows us to sense that harmony inside us. And the same with walking in the countryside, swimming. There are so many activities which... I think one of the reasons why we follow these activities is because they create some degree of spaciousness and harmony inside us. So let me um, read a, a poem now. And this poem... Um, whether it actually is a poem is a kind of a moot question because sometimes people say to me, that's not poetry. It doesn't rhyme or it doesn't have a rhythm. But, you know, who knows what poetry who, who can tell what poetry is? The main thing is, is that it sort of arises, takes a form, and then um, is transmitted to the reader or to the audience. So this is a, a poem called Become the Sky, which I think expresses... The, the basic, one of the basic qualities of spiritual awakening, which I mentioned earlier, that sense of expansiveness, that sense of no longer being a separate individual, transcending separateness, and at the same time, transcending anxiety and fear. I think on, a, on, you know, on such a beautiful setting with so much, such an expansive sky out there around us. This is become the sky. The cage you've been trapped inside for longer than you can remember might seem so sturdy and secure that you don't even dream of escaping anymore. Like a bird that used to beat its wings, but now just lets them hang limply by its sides. But the bars of your cage aren't solid. They're a mirage made up of fears and desires, projected by your restless mind, fueled by the attention you give them. Just for a moment, let your mind be quiet. And see how fears evaporate. See how desires withdraw, like the claws of an animal that's no longer threatened. Watch the bars melt away and let the world immerse you. Let your mind space merge with the space out there until there is only space without distinction. Stretch your wings and become the sky. There's a great quote, one of my favourite quotes from one of my favourite spiritual texts, which is the, the Upanishads, the Indian Upanishads. And the quote goes, very simple, it says, Where there is separateness, there is fear. And I think that's really true. I think most separateness, sorry, most fear and anxiety stem from the sense of being a, a separate, isolated individual enclosed within your own mental space. Because when you are a separate, you are other to the world, and the world is somehow out there on the other side. And you feel threatened by the world because it's other. 
The same way that you, if you have an enemy, you feel threatened by the enemy because it or he or she is other to you. So while the world is out there on the other side, there's always a sense of being threatened. And that includes other people. If you feel that other people are other to you, you feel threatened by them. When you sense that you are connected to the world and connected to other people, or that you are one with the world, or one with other people, then fear and anxiety fade away. They can't exist because the conditions which create them have faded away. And that's why I think every spiritual teacher, every spiritual tradition places some emphasis on transcending separateness and therefore transcending fear and anxiety. Maybe even transcending death because um, fear of death is rooted in the sense of fear of the annihilation of your identity. And somehow there's a sense that death is an enemy because it can destroy your identity and everything you've accumulated in your life, all of your achievements, all of your possessions, all of your success. Everything is potentially taken away from you. So if you can gain a sense of acceptance of death, then all of that fear is also taken away. But I said um, I was going to focus on a couple of different characteristics of spiritual awakening. So I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll focus on the first of those now. And I, I did find in my research that um, when people, particularly when people undergo a sudden transformation following a diagnosis of cancer, uh, or maybe a bereavement, or maybe following addiction or intense depression, there are certain qualities which they develop, which kind of constitute what spiritual awakening is. And one of those qualities was a sense of, you could call it disidentification from their thinking minds. And again, this is something which really every spiritual tradition talks about. I remember um, years ago, when I was uh, about 24, I went to see a meditation teacher. I, I did a, a Buddhist meditation class. And after the class, I spoke to the teacher and he said to me, how's the, how's the meditation going, Steve? And I said, oh, it's terrible. You know, every time I sit down to meditate, my mind just gets full of chattering thoughts and I just can't control them. I just, my mind just gets, my attention gets taken away. So it's really, it's been going really badly. Uh, but the teacher said, that's really good. That's a really good sign. And I thought, wow, that's, that's crazy. How can that be a good sign? But he said, well, it means that you are not identified with your thoughts. You can watch them pass by, even though you're disturbed by them. You know that you are not your thoughts. He said that most people don't realise that they are not their thoughts. Most people are so identified with their thinking minds that there's no distance between them and their thoughts. So I thought, oh, OK, that's, that's fine. Uh, so it's that sense of not being your thoughts, being aware that your thoughts are a kind of stream passing by and that you don't have to be taken away by the stream. You can just watch your thoughts in the same way that, here's another meditative metaphor, uh, also based on water. But if you imagine that you are sitting on a riverbank uh, on a day like today, are there any rivers near here? Any streams near here? Okay, yeah, imagine the stream at the Nunu down the road. So imagine you're just sitting on the bank, uh, watching the stream pass by, and in the same way, you can be inside your own mind, inside your own mental space, and just watch the stream of thoughts pass by as if you're sitting on a riverbank. So that even, you know, even if worrying thoughts pass by, you may have a worrying thought about the future, but you can just allow it to pass by. You can think, what a stupid thought. I'm not going to listen to that one. And you just allow it to pass by. Or maybe a thought about the past. Sometimes we are disturbed by thoughts about the past. That, create a, that may create a sense of guilt or bitterness. You know, why did he do that to me? Why did that have to happen? But again, if you know that that's just a thought that passes by, you don't have to allow it to affect you. You can just allow it to pass by and it doesn't disturb you. In most cases, when people identify with thoughts, it creates some degree of negativity inside them, maybe a sense of some emotional disturbance, worry about the future, 
anxiety about the future, feelings of bitterness about the past or embarrassment or hurt and so on. But if you know that thoughts are just forms that arise in your mind, you just allow them to pass by and they don't disturb you. So I think one way of doing that, one way of disidentifying from your thoughts is to just think of, think of, think, think of thinking. Maybe that's the wrong word. Just see the process of thinking as, you know, the, the body is full of different processes. So we have like the blood, the circulation of our blood. We have our hearts beating. Our breathing is a process and so on. Digestion is a process. And thinking is the same. Thinking is just a process. It's just a sort of neurological, physiological quirk, a kind of this process of associational images about the future and the past. Uh, sometimes it's fragments of conversations we've heard that replay in our minds. Sometimes it's uh, songs that we've heard on the radio. All kinds of nonsense just sort of filters through our minds. And it's just a process like uh, digestion or the circulation of the blood. So actually, I'm going to read a little poem now, which is based on that theme. And it's so new that um, I only typed it up the other day. It hasn't yet been published. Um, but this is a poem called You Are Not the Process. And following this poem, I'll lead you into a little meditation based on the poem. You are not the process. It's demeaning sometimes to watch your thoughts pass by and realize how judgmental and petty they can be. Like being sober at a debauched, drunken party, watching your friends make fools of themselves. Can this really be me? You ask yourself, ashamed. Is my mind really so full of nonsense? But whoever said that these thoughts were yours? They're only a process taking place inside you, like digestion or the circulation of your blood. And you are not the process any more than you are your digestion. <coughs> Pay as little attention to your thoughts as you do to your circulating blood. Take the contents of your thoughts as seriously as the contents of your intestines. And then your thoughts will slow down and fade away. Until there's only a background noise that doesn't disturb you. Like a tiny television set turned down low, flickering from a corner of your room. Then you'll find that there is nothing and no one to be ashamed of. So, uh, yeah, let me lead you through a short little meditation based on that idea. So again, just close your eyes for a moment. And... Let's just bring our attention to a couple of those processes I mentioned in the poem. So first of all, just bring your attention to the process of breathing. Just feel the air as it enters your nose. And again, as it leaves your nose, feel the air brushing the inside of your nostrils as you breathe in and out. Feel how your stomach rises and falls with your breath. Just be aware of the, the process of breathing. Mm -hmm. 
And now, just bring your attention to your heart. And if you can, bring your attention to the beating of your heart. Just feel the process of your heart, the pulse of your heart beating. And also be aware of how, from your heart, the blood circulates through your body, through your veins, towards your organs. So if you can, just bring your attention to the blood circulating all the way through your body, all around your body. is another process, the process of blood circulation. And now let's bring our attention to another process, the process of digestion. Just bring your attention to your stomach and be aware that any food that you've recently eaten is slowly undergoing the process of digestion. And see if you can be aware of all of those four processes at the same time. So that's breathing, the pulse of your heart, the circulation of the blood, and your digestion, all at the same time. <coughs> and finally, Let's bring our attention to the mind and to any thoughts that may be taking place in your mind. And let's be aware that that's just another process, the process of associational thinking. It's just another process like breathing or the circulation of the blood or digestion. And you can just allow it to take place in the same way that you allow digestion to take place without identifying with it. You just accept that it's happening and don't identify with it. Be aware that there is a place inside you from which you are aware of all of these processes, including your thinking. There's a place inside you, you could call it a witness or an observing self, which watches all of these processes. And rather than your thinking mind or your ego mind, this witness or observing self is your authentic self. So just for a few moments, allow yourself to, to be rooted in that observing self watching all of the processes taking place.
inside you. And again, let's slowly bring our attention back to the chair you're sitting on, your feet on the ground, the other sounds around you. Let's slowly open our eyes again. So a good way of um, summarizing that is to, to be aware of the process of thinking but don't be aware of or don't pay attention to the content of thinking. So you know that the process is taking place, but you don't even really take, you don't take seriously the content of your thoughts. But this doesn't mean that thinking is unnecessary, completely unnecessary and should be stopped altogether. Because obviously from time to time, we, you know, we need to think. Occasionally we've got logistical problems to deal with, you know, holidays to plan. Uh, mathematical problems to solve, which I'm sure that occurs quite frequently. We frequently have mathematical problems to solve in our lives. Hopefully not. But um, maybe engineers do and accountants. But yeah, occasionally thinking is useful. It is a logical tool. But really we should be able to put down the tool when we don't need it. In the same way that you put down a screwdriver when you don't need to uh, assemble a table. I'm getting lots of, sort of strange metaphors. <laughs> They're just just arising from the depths of my mind. But, you know, in, in any situation where you do feel that you're becoming caught up in mental turbulence when you are paying too much attention to your thoughts, that means that you are beginning, becoming caught up in the process of thinking. Then it, it's really helpful to just bring our attention down into other processes, like the processes of, I've mentioned there, circulation, digestion. Anytime you bring your attention to the body, your mind becomes quieter. When you give your attention to the body, you give less attention to your thoughts and slowly, the mind is a bit like a car. The more fuel you give it, the longer it will run. When you take away the fuel of attention, it slowly begins to calm down and loses its momentum. Um, how are we doing for time, by the way? Can you tell me the time? I know the time is an illusion, but... Quarter to five. Yeah, I like, I like Einstein once said, time is an illusion, but it's a useful illusion. So yeah, I'll just um, spend a few minutes talking about another of the qualities which I mentioned earlier, which is gratitude or appreciation. As I mentioned, everybody who undergoes spiritual awakening, particularly in the form of a transformation uh, following bereavement, or a diagnosis of cancer, or any degree of mental trauma or turbulence. One of the qualities which emerges very strongly is a sense of gratitude or appreciation. And I sometimes think that one of human beings' biggest difficulties, I know we have many difficulties, but one of them is, the biggest one maybe, is what I call the taking for granted syndrome. And, you know, human beings are very adaptable and our, our adaptability is sometimes useful because it can enable us to get used to difficult situations. But it also means that we often get used to positive situations and we stop seeing the, the value or the true reality of positive situations. And sometimes it takes um, an encounter with death or an illness or maybe the illness of somebody else around us for us to become really aware of how valuable our lives are and how valuable all of the things which constitute our lives are, like the people around us, uh, our health, the social conditions that we in Western Europe live in of relative affluence and relative peacefulness. And also life itself. You know, life 
even if you believe in some form of life after death, and my personal feeling is that there is probably some form of life after death, even if it's very difficult to conceive of what it may be like. Even if you believe that, still life in this form, in this world, as we know it, is temporary. You know, if we're lucky, we'll be here for 80-something years, if we're lucky. Uh, but really, it's a, it's a gift to be alive for a certain amount of time in this world, to be born into this world, to live in this world for a certain number of years, and to experience this beautiful, strange, mysterious world we live in the beauties of nature, the complexities of other human beings, the beauties of other life forms. It's a gift. But often we take life itself and all of the things in our lives for granted. Uh, we stop seeing the value, the preciousness of everything in our lives. We focus on the negative. We start to feel bitter. We start to complain. We feel anxious and so on. So it's really important to, to cultivate a sense of gratitude. And as I said before, when people recover from cancer, or even, not, even if they don't recover, even if they are, are at that moment ill with cancer, or when people have a bereavement or recover from addiction, appreciation is one of the, the, cult, the qualities they experience. Now, I'll just give you one or two examples from my research. One of my um, projects was about people who undergo sudden personal transformation following uh, disabilities and accidents or injuries. And one of the people I spoke to in this research project was a woman called Jill Hicks. Uh, it was an Australian woman living in London. And in 2006, I think it was, you may remember there was a terrorist attack in London, and I think around 40 people died. There was a series of bombs in the tube trains and on the buses. And Jill Hicks was sitting on a tube train when a bomb exploded just a, two metres away from her. And she was um, very seriously injured. She actually lost her limbs in the accident. She came close to death. For two or, th for two or three weeks, she was kind of hovering on the verge of, of death. Uh, but when she recovered, after a few weeks, when she regained consciousness and realized that she was going to continue to survive, she realized that everything would have to change. She realized that she would be living a new life. And she actually called it Life 2. She called her old life Life 1, and that was over. Now she was living Life 2. And one of the things she felt was a new sense of purpose. She had to give up her old job, which I think she'd been a designer or an architect, but it no longer seemed meaningful, so she finished her job. And she felt an intense, a very strong sense of purpose to bring some harmony into the world. So she became a charity worker. She founded her own charity. And she began to speak to different communities around the UK, trying to promote peace between communities. But most of all, she felt an incredible sense of appreciation that she was still alive, that she'd come so close to death, but she had come back. And everything in her life seemed incredibly precious, even just drinking a glass of water, eating a meal. And even just seeing the city or seeing nature, everything just seemed wonderful. The privilege of being alive to experience the world. So often it does take an encounter with death to really wake us up to the, the preciousness of life. And another thing which can happen, which can have the same awakening effect, is a journey to the moon. <laughs> now I've heard that, is this true? I heard that there are a couple of space um, astronauts who live on the Isle of Man, is that true? Yeah. So maybe they've experienced this, I don't know. But, um, but in, the, in the late 1960s and 1970s, sorry, early 1970s in America, I think about 18 people went to the moon, and nobody's been back since then. But most of those people who went to the moon came back with an amazing sense of appreciation for life on Earth, because they saw the Earth from space, they saw this tiny blue oasis spinning around in, in the middle of the, the vacuum, the darkness of space. They realized that everything they loved, everything that meant anything to them was on this tiny planet spinning around. And they also realized how meaningless boundaries were. You know, there were, there were no countries, there were no continents, there was just one planet. 
spinning around in space. So when they came back, actually one of them um, went on to found a kind of an institute investigating spiritual experiences and paranormal experiences. One or two of them became evangelical Christians because they felt somehow they'd had, a, they'd had a glimpse of God and they interpreted it, interpreted it within the framework of Christianity. A lot of them became very altruistic. Some of them began to meditate. And one guy just said, um, I think he was a guy who died recently, Jim Bean, who was an astronaut who died just a few weeks ago. And he said that ever since he came back from space, he has never complained about the weather because he's just glad that there is weather. And he also said that when he came back, he just used to sit in shopping malls in America and just watch people go by, just amazed at the miracle of being alive on this planet people just living their everyday lives. So I'd like you to just imagine for a moment that you, where is the moon? Imagine that you are up there, wherever it is. Can we see the moon? Maybe not. But imagine that you are on the moon looking down at this tiny blue planet, uh, however many thousands of miles away it is, about 50,000 is it? 50,000 miles away. So imagine that you were out there in space on the moon looking down on this planet. Everything that you love, everything that you have, everything that means anything to you is on this tiny planet. And obviously if you're up there for a period, imagine you're up there for a, a few months, you're obviously going to miss certain things about your life on this planet. People, hobbies, experiences. So just think for a moment about your life, which aspects of your life would seem most valuable to you? Which aspects of your life would you miss the most if you were out there on the moon for a long period of time? And maybe just tell the person next to you which, which things in your life you would miss the most, which would be most valuable to you. Just mention one or two things to the person next to you. Okay. Uh, I was thinking about what I would miss. I would miss my son Hugh, who has fallen asleep here. <laughs> don't, don't wake him up. Way. Hopefully that was because uh, my meditation was so calming and relaxing. <laughs> Not boring. But what a shame you can't hear me. <laughs> but, I mean, but seriously, um, it is people. The people in our lives, often when they are close to us, members of our family, uh, old friends even, parents, we take them so much for granted because they're so familiar to us. We don't see them as real people. And we still sometimes feel negatively towards them. We complain about them. I'm thinking about Hugh here. <laughs> but... Um, but sometimes, occasionally, we see them as real people detached from our familiar vision and suddenly think, wow, you know, isn't he wonderful or isn't she wonderful? I sometimes get this with my father. You know, sometimes, occasionally, I see him as a real person that's not my father. I think, wow, he's not the person I think he is. And he's, uh, you know, he's, he's special. Somehow, a, a veil of familiarity fails, falls away and we see people as they really are. So that's wonderful. That's when we stop taking things for granted. That's when we see things in their reality. So the things you've mentioned, you know, that you would miss while you were on the moon, just, you know, remember those, remind yourself about them and try to cultivate a, a sense of appreciation for those things. And um, just as we move to the close of my session, um, I'd like to just return to the beginning. Obviously, time is an illusion, so what does it matter whether it was the beginning or an end? It's the same. And obviously, as we said before, in spiritual experiences, we transcend the tenses of time. So let's return to the beginning. Let's return to that sense of harmony um, which lies below the surface of our minds, just like the deep stillness of the sea beneath the turbulent waves on the surface of the sea. 
And also you can feel that stillness around you, not just inside you. It doesn't just belong to you. It belongs to the space around you. It belongs to the other people around you. And you can feel it flowing outside you, immersing all of the other people in this room, filling the space around you, flowing above you towards the sky. And this stillness, this harmony, it's the essence of our being. It's the essence of being itself. And it's what connects us with each other, with the whole of the, the earth that we're living on, the whole of the cosmos that we're living inside. So let me just read a short poem which expresses the essence. The essence of you is emptiness. The essence of you is love. The essence of you is energy. The essence of you is bliss. The essence of you flows like a fountain from a pool of pure consciousness at the heart of reality. The essence of you surges with an eternal force that has borrowed you for this lifetime. <coughs> The essence of you is deathless. This form will wither and dissolve away. Then the essence will return to its source to find a new expression. The essence of you stretches inside and outside your body. Inside and outside time within and beyond the world. At home, in peace, in every place. So let's remain attuned to, to the essence of our beings. And if your eyes are closed, let's slowly open them again. And I hope the sheep are feeling uh, relaxed now. That's the end of my talk. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>